It is Tuesday, the 1st of February, and this is Love Notes, daily devotions from Holy Trinity Lutheran Church. Welcome. Yesterday we heard the story of Elijah, the great prophet of the northern kingdom of Israel, in 1 Kings. Today we're going to move to 2 Kings and hear a story about his successor, Elisha. The story today begins with the commander of the army of Aram. Naaman is his name. Naaman is a mighty and powerful man who is kind of like the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff for the entire kingdom of Aram. And they are a formidable force. The people of all of that region are afraid of Naaman and his army because of all of the success that they have notched up under his command. Now, Naaman is a very powerful man, but he's also got a little bit of a problem. He has leprosy. Apparently not enough of a leprosy that he is taken away from his job, but he can cover it up. He can make it not quite as well known, and so he can continue to work each and every day as this mighty and powerful man. Now, leprosy in ancient times is any kind of skin disease that people thought might be infectious. It doesn't refer to the disfiguring kind of leper colonies in our age. Naaman has a problem, though, and he'd love to get rid of it, because if it gets worse, he could lose his job, his livelihood, his household, and everything, really. So Naaman has tried all of the cures that are available to him, and one day a little Israelite girl comes. She's been taken as a slave on a raid into Israel, so she's uh, the spoils of war. And whether she says it with some kind of attitude or not, I'm not sure, but she says something to the effect of, if you were in Israel, where I'm from, there is a mighty prophet there who could make you clean. Well, Naaman decides that he better go check this out, and so he goes to his king, and he receives a letter introducing him to the king of Israel, and they go off. Naaman stocks up a bunch of things to pay for his services. He's got gold and silver and clothing and all kinds of other things. He's got a great big retinue of people who go with him, soldiers, armor, everything that goes along with being that kind of commander and powerful man accompanies him down the highway as he goes to Israel. Now, thinking like a foreigner, thinking like somebody who worships a god who is in bed with the local king, Naaman goes to the king of Israel, and he says, here's a letter from my boss, who, by the way, can come here and take over your kingdom if you don't listen to me. Here's a letter from my boss and all kinds of stuff. I want you to tell your court prophet, this Elisha, to come and heal me. Well, the king of Israel knows that this isn't how it works with the prophets of Israel. The prophets of Israel rarely have anything to do with the king, and they sure don't work for them. As a matter of fact, they're most often a big pain in the neck. And so the king of Israel tears his clothes and grieves, knowing that he can't fulfill the request that's been given to him. And so likely, well, Naaman's going to get angry, and we know it's going to happen after that. When Elisha gets word of this, he sends word and says, why did you go to him? Have the man come to me, and I'll take care of it. So off Naaman goes to Elisha, who's living in a little shack, who's got his servant with him, and not much more. Elisha is in the house doing whatever prophets do. Maybe it's washing the dishes. Maybe it's making a little meal. Maybe it's praying. I don't know what. But Naaman sends for him, and a servant comes out and says, well, Elisha says, go and wash yourself in the Jordan River seven times, and you will be made clean. Naaman is outraged. Naaman, who this powerful and rich, who has gold in his chariot, who has silver in his chariot, who has come to buy the services, to impress the prophet, to make sure the God of Israel takes notice of him, is absolutely outraged that a servant has come out, the prophet hasn't even come out, and all he wants him to do is wash in this poor excuse of a river called Jordan. It's not much. It's certainly not as good as the rivers back home. And so Naaman is offended. One of his servants 
And notice that the Israelite servant girl, and now a servant of Naaman, are the people who move the grace along in the story, comes and said, well, excuse me, sir, but if he'd asked you to do something hard, wouldn't you have done it? Naaman relents. He goes and he washes himself, and sure enough, he is cured. His skin is renewed like a baby's. The story goes on further and shows us that Naaman, Naaman comes to understand that the only God there is is the God of Israel. So much so that he digs up some of the dirt in Israel and takes it back home to Aram so that he can worship on the ground that has been consecrated by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You see, Naaman is converted. Naaman is overwhelmed by the grace of God. And Naaman, a foreign king, a foreign man of military might, becomes a follower of God because God knows no boundaries and God will deliver to all those who call. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, sometimes we think we're big deals, but then sometimes we're not. Help us to know that you're the only big deal there is and that if we can humble ourselves like Naaman, if we can set our own egos aside and we can do the simple things that you call us to do, we will be blessed. Lord, help us to not take ourselves so seriously and take you with deadly seriousness because you are the God who speaks even after death, who brings life from nothing. We ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.